name is Renee Miller. I'm the Associate Director here at the Oregon Bioscience Incubator. And this Lunch and Learn is called Streamlining DEI with Inclusive Hiring and Retention Tools. So while we get settled, um, some housekeeping items uh, will rotate around on the screen. If you're on Zoom, please keep yourself on mute and introduce yourself in the chat so we can know who you are and you can put your LinkedIn profile in the chat as well. And mine will be in there as well. Um, Caitlin, would you like to take questions as we go or at the end? We'll wait to the end. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. So if you have questions along the way, um, in the, those of you in the room, just hold them till the end. And those of you on Zoom can go ahead and type them into the chat and then we'll get to them uh, as, at the end. So um, wanted to uh, go ahead and start sharing the other slides and introduce our sponsor. Cambia Health Solutions has been sponsoring this Equity and Leadership Series for 2023, and this is the third in the series. And so we appreciate you. We really um, appreciate your, your support and your sponsorship. Lori Erdman is the Director of Talent and Acquisition from Cambia. And I'm gonna show you some slides. Adrian's going to share some slides on the screen. And I'll show you every person. All right. Okay, great. Should we get started or? All right. Um, and I think Control L will make it full screen. There's always technical. Oh, yeah. There we go. Perfect. Um, okay, great. Okay. Actually, can we back up a few slides? There we go. There we go. Okay. Great. Um, well, first of all, I just uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I know this is a, uh, you know, it can be as just excited to be able to be a sponsor of this series and, um, you know, bring bring our insights, um, however that may help with all that you are doing. So, um, so we're excited to be here. Um, so a little bit about Cambia for those of you that aren't familiar. Let's go ahead. Yeah. So um, so you might know us by our uh, brand in the marketplace, which is Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield Oregon. We also operate in three other states in uh, in the Pacific Northwest, we operate six health plans uh, and um, with nearly 5,000 employees. So what you can see here too is, you know, we are, so the interesting thing about Cambia, one of the things I really enjoy about working for us is that we are a nonprofit. So we pay taxes, we're not a 501c3, but it, what it does is it allows us to really focus on doing something bolder than um, other companies other in, in our health insurance space might be able to do. And so what you see here on the screen is our what we call our cause. Other ones might call a mission, but it's pretty bold um, that, you know, when people come to us, they're like, you are here to really be a catalyst for transforming the healthcare system. Um, and we do it in our own unique way and with a lot of technology. I know we've had other speakers here uh, talking about technology, our commitment to health equity. We'll talk a little bit about that today because that certainly integrates with our DEI um, strategy. So that's a little bit about us. Um, we do have a very strong commitment, which we'll talk about uh, to diversity, it's DEI, and, um, and that really supports us. And I think the final thing to say is we've, you know, we've been around for over 100 years. We have liked to say in the last couple of years, we've made it now made it through two pandemics. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so, um, you know, that it's uh, sometimes being head of talent acquisition, it's it's something we say sometimes about, you know, that and we were just talking about the uh, talking about this with Caitlin, that um, stability is kind of the new sexy when it comes to recruiting employees. So um and uh, providing something that feels long-term as, as well as meaningful. So, you know, that that's my, my initial plug about how do you, how do you really execute on a DEI policy uh, and approach when you're recruiting. So next slide. And a little bit about our larger focus uh, as Cambia, 
you know, when we think about DEI, we think about it from the perspective of our members. We have a diverse population of people that we serve across our three states or four states, sorry. Um, we are also very active in our community. We have a foundation that is uh, operates in the communities all across our four state footprint, um, supporting particularly those those groups that are focused on those that are less fortunate and um, and maybe don't have the resources that that others do. So our community focus is also incredibly important, and all of that is underpinned by our employees and you know making sure that our employee population reflects the population within our four states and particularly our members. So that's that's just a little bit of the overview. The next slide will show a little bit more detail. Some of the, the statistics we won't go through. I'm not, I'm not gonna go, you know, take you through all of these, but as I said, you know, the the foundation is our employees. And I'll talk in a moment about our strategy, about how we how we recruit, make sure we, we how we run DEI through our recruiting process. Um, but we also, you know, we've gotten good results. We are a federal contractor, uh, which means we have an affirmative action plan. Um, and so we know the data around, you know, what is what is available when it comes to different ethnicity groups, gender in all of our markets by job profiles. Um, so that really gives us a lot of information helping us become a very, you know, for, for the Pacific Northwest, quite a diverse employer. Um, and one of our underpinnings is, is, or what I think the foundational pieces that allows us to recruit so well in this space is we actually have a diverse, um, not only diverse by gender, but also diversity by um, uh, people of color on our uh, on our leadership team. So that really helps attract a lot of folks. Um, and then some more details around our community. We have a lot of volunteer hours, 11,000. Uh, I think this last year, uh, there are employees being involved again in the community, giving back, um, and then some stats around uh, our member population. So let's go to the next slide. And then, oops, actually one more back, there we go. Um, Perfect. So, you know, what we talk about how do we how do we really attract individuals to, uh, from diverse backgrounds and populations? And part of it is we try to make it welcoming. And this is a key pillar for us. And so we have a lot of uh, we have actually seven um, employee resource groups, which are we've got about 20 percent of our employee population that are members of one of the groups. And so. Um, a lot of different opportunities. We've got a um, group for Asian Pacific Islanders, Pride Group, um, Black Organization for, for Leadership Development. You can see these on the screen, but also our military um, community. So we are, that's a really important one for us. We do, we've gotten a number of awards. Human Rights Commission, we're a favored military employer, so you know we we invest in this. So, which brings me really to the the final slide, and just what I want to talk about is how do we drive DEI through our talent acquisition and recruiting? And some of the stuff I've just shared with you is how we focus on being welcoming and inclusive, and from the ERGs to a diverse leadership team, um, is a big part of how we do that, making it a, a welcoming and inclusive environment and culture at Cambia. The other place is we generally understand the gaps. I talked about our being an affirmative action uh, plans as a federal contractor. We know our gaps from a global perspective, and we also look also at our gaps on disability, um, which actually I can't say is a gap because we actually exceed the, the national utilization uh, in, in disability. So we're very proud of that, but we also look at, at gaps that we have in military hiring, things of that nature. So we know it globally across the organization, but then we also, you know, one of the things, and, and Caitlin and I were talking about this, is I make sure recruiters, when they're coming to a hiring manager about their team's needs, what are the gaps on your team? What are the gaps in experience? Um, you know, educational background that you might have. Um, and then we go and try to find those uh, and make sure that the candidate, that the hiring manager has a diverse candidate slate from which to choose. And then all of that is based, is is laid on top of the foundation of a strong brand, not just as a, in the marketplace of health insurance, but also as a DEI employer. We've made a multi-year commitment for many years now of trying to be in places so we're getting kind of diverse 
uh, employee populations and getting our brand out there and letting people know that we do have a welcoming um, award-winning culture. So that's a little bit about us. Again, we're really happy to be here and be part of the discussion and um, support this organization. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for sponsoring. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, and now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Caitlin Roof. Caitlin has over 15 years of experience developing corporate and nonprofit relationships across various industries. Having spent the last six years in talent and workforce solution management for entry level to C-suite positions, she brings a deep experience in talent acquisition strategies and partnering with clients to attract and retain exceptional talent and to ensure a distinct candidate experience. Having been a hiring manager and, and recruiter, she intimately understands the challenges and opportunities that exist in search. As an ally and advocate, she values the role that diversity, equity, and inclusion play in corporate and cultural development. Caitlin has advised boards on DEI training and employee resource group development and has co-led an LGBTQIA plus ERG for two and a half years. She also actively volunteers and seeks to make an impact in her local community. And her contact uh, LinkedIn profile is going to be in the chat. So yeah. welcome, Caitlin. Thanks, Renee. Excited to be here. Thanks to everyone that's joined here um, in the studio, uh, <laughs> uh, as well as online. I'm very excited to be here. As Renee said, I'm very um out there in the community, really want loving to have these conversations and be an advocate and a, a consultant to to clients and to those that are in the job hunt. So today, I'm really going to focus on tools that you can use to help make sure that DEI is a focus in your job postings, in the interview process, and then, you know, kind of how to carry the torch from diversity hiring to maintaining um, a very safe and culturally diverse organization, right? So it's not necessarily to discussing diversity itself, but really as an organization, how you can kind of come together and, and make sure that your practices are inclusive. Um, so with that, Next slide. I always like to start conversations off with a safety and diversity message. Um, I love this picture. It is fall. It is my favorite season. Um, so the safety message today is really just um, about kind of being aware of the things that we start to turn on and maybe utilize a little bit more during the season. I love candles. This is the season for candle lighting, all the scents and smells. And don't forget to blow them out. I've done this so many times. <laughs> um, you know, make sure any sort of like electric blankets, fires, all that kind of stuff are all out. Uh, and just making sure before you leave the house that, you um, you know, all of that is turned off. And then for all of the fun decorating that is this season, make sure you've got a spotter out there uh, and uh, it's helping you to, to put up any sort of de decorations we've got coming up. So that's our safety message. And for diversity, want to say um, happy National Coming Out Day. Um, this is a day that we started celebrating in 1988. Um, after there was a march on Washington for the LGBTQIA plus community that was living out loud. And this is a day that really recognizes that uh, there's a lot of bravery that comes with coming out. Um, and when you come out, you don't just come out once, right? You don't just say to one person, hey, I'm out, I'm queer, this is my life. You have to do this and relive this multiple times in life. So today is a day that we really honor and celebrate those that are strong enough, brave enough, powerful enough to lead in front and uh, to show that that being out is, is a great thing and um, you can live and thrive in being who you are and that is very accepted. So uh, happy National Coming Out Day. It also happens to be my birthday. <laughs> What a joy to share this day with the queer community. I love it. So, um, yeah, just had to throw it in there. All right. So now we're going to get into um, the fun part. So what is diversity, equity, and inclusion? I don't want to belabor this point. Um, really, diversity means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I'll go into that Oxford uh, dictionary definition there in a second. But the picture below, I think, kind of helps if you're a visual <laughs> learner like I am to kind of visualize what these things mean. So diversity is all the things that make us unique. 
and interesting and who we are and human, right? Um, equity is, you've got equality, which you hear the word a lot versus equity. Equality is giving everyone a seat. Equity is giving everyone a seat that actually fits them. Mm -hmm. If that kind of helps to visualize it, right? We all sitting in the same chair, maybe some of us. I always like to think of a plane. It's like everyone sits in coach, that's, that's equality. And then equity would be having access to either um, seats that are large enough for you or small enough for you. You have, you know, places to put your animals or whatever it is. So hopefully that helps to paint uh, a picture. And then when it comes to inclusion, um, you know, it's I kind of take it back to, to being a kid on a playground. Right. So you've got segregation where it's like, this is my playground. That's your playground. Um, you've got exclusion, which is like, this is my playground and you're kind of on the peripheral, right? Outside of looking in. Um, integration is, this is our playground, but this is your area that you get to play in, the rest is mine. And then inclusion is, this is just ours. We share it. Do you want to go play on the monkey bars? So that's kind of hopefully another kind of visual for you. Again, a visual learner, so sometimes this help me. Um, you know, Oxford Dictionary defines diversity is a practice or quality of including or involving people from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds and of different genders, sexual orientations, et cetera. That et cetera drives me nuts, um, <laughs> which brings me to my next slide. Um, what's in the et cetera? And I think this is as an organization where you can really start to kind of dig in and look at how to approach diversity for your, your employees. So when you think about the et cetera, there's kind of, again, visual learner, the, uh, the iceberg is like for me kind of helpful, right? So you've got your primary, what you kind of consider, what you can visually see. So you know, oftentimes age, physical ability, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, but then you have everything underneath that you don't necessarily see. And some of that comes out in conversation and getting to know your colleagues, your managers, your leaders, your directors. And that is really, that's where that psychological safety environment comes from. It's the what's underneath the iceberg that we don't necessarily <clears throat> know that uh, to create a very diverse uh, organization, understanding and bringing a place of um, kind of acceptance is where those underlying um, et cetera's lie. So when you're looking at putting a job des description together and you're looking at building out teams, it's really those things that are, are important to kind of acknowledge. So we'll go on to the next slide. So when it comes to job postings, inclusive language is really important. I've got a visual kind of um, example of, of language that we'll get into next, but, um, Removing language bias is really helpful when someone's reading a job description. If you can see yourself in a job, right, as you read it, you can visualize yourself doing that work. That creates connectivity with the organization, and you have a better, I would say, kind of understanding or thought process of like, okay, maybe I would fit in here. I can visualize myself here. But when you start to use non gender neutral language or other language that kind of alienates somebody, it becomes less immersive, right? Like, well, maybe, is this the environment for me? So these are just a couple of different um, programs that you can use. I will go on record and say, I have looked at these. I'm not um, promoting any of them whatsoever. These are tools. I, I, it's up to you to go do your due diligence and make sure that they're the right tool for you. But I thought it would be nice just to have access to uh, a couple of um, different sites that you can kind of do some gender and um, excuse me, uh, inclusive language tools. So yeah. on the next slide, this is an example um, that I pulled from a, a LinkedIn post that I thought was really interesting. Um, this person is talking about scaling up their recruiting team and they've just hired two people and how excited they are to have these two people start. And I'm curious if anyone wants to venture a guess <laughs> at what gender each of these people might be. I don't know if you want to throw it in the chat if you're online or if anyone here wants to volunteer an answer. Yeah. Um, male. Which one? Um, male gender. Yes. Uh, and I think because of the words like competitive, veteran, 
Um, uh, just those couple of words come to mind. First. <clears throat> totally, absolutely. Yeah, so in this example, the top, the 12 year SF startup recruiting veteran, they're talking about a man, they use their name, in that, I blinked everything out because I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, just as a, a really good example. Um, and then below that, they're talking about a woman and it's love, it's emotion, right? They say her, they don't use her name. So this is where, when you talk about the the language that you use in painting a picture, um, you know, I personally was a little like, one you can do better than that you know and like I don't know if I would want to work for a company that isn't just a little bit more aware um and so this is where using these sorts of tools can become very helpful cool all right next um so inclusive sourcing and screening this is I'm sure Lori <laughs> where you live sometimes yes um, you know, there's not a silver bullet for any of this. It, it, it is a, a bit of trial and error, and this is communication and getting feedback from the folks that you that you employ. Um, but these are a couple of tools that you can use. I've used some of them personally. Again, I'm not promoting any of these, so I'm not going to kind of call that out. But um, so for the sourcing tools, there are becoming more and more popular resources to go to that help serve underrepresented communities and folks that come from more diverse backgrounds. And when you kind of think about that, um, diverse backgrounds can be people that don't necessarily have access to education, or they might be um, foreign students that are looking for work, or I mean, there's a, there's a multitude of different reasons that somebody might be kind of flying under your radar when it comes to um, how to identify these folks. Um, there's lots of certifications that folks can use. I will say um, many of the recruiters on my team uh, at um, Scion are certified in diversity recruiting. And it's not to alien people, it's to understand how to open up your search so that your scope just kind of goes from very um, focused to uh, focused, but still more broad to include more people. Uh, and then, you know, same with the screening tools that you're really just trying to look at someone's talent set and not necessarily the school that they went to, but that they got it free, right? And not necessarily their name um, or where they've come from or um, anything else, but you're really looking at skills and abilities. And so these are uh, some other additional tools. Buyer beware on AR, AI, right? Um, I think we've all probably heard or seen some of this stuff in the news. Again, do your due diligence, nothing's perfect, including humans. So like, have a second pair of eyes, ask somebody of a different something than you, like, do you uh, align with this? Do you Can you see yourself in this? Um, you know, this is where communication becomes really, really meaningful and helpful. Uh, and then as far as like inclusive interviews, this is, this gets challenging, <laughs> as I'm sure Lori, Lori is very Next much uh, aware of. Um, training managers, especially new managers, um is really is really beneficial right um being a man there's so much that comes with being a manager you're a leader you're leading people you're in challenging different situations you're working with people that might be very different from you for a multitude of reasons um so going through training is always very very helpful um get people involved in the interview process acknowledge your biases. I know that can be really hard. Um, I'm going to tell a really quick story. I promise it, it got a point. Um, there was a person that came to my door recently and they were actually going door to door asking for money because they had gone through life and made some um, not so great decisions. And as a result, they were really struggling to find a job. And they were going because they, they needed money and they didn't really know where to turn and they didn't want to be one of you know the folks in a parking lot and they thought that this would be a more thoughtful, meaningful way. Everyone right now, I'm assuming, has a visual of who this person is, right? Maybe can you picture somebody coming to your door, what they might look like, how old they might be, what they might be wearing, um, how they might talk. So all of that is how you... That's a that's a bias. That's not positive and negative. That's just bias. Just how you see things. Um, this was a, a young Latin woman who was. 
asked to take care of a family member and had to drop out of high school and was in a situation where she was still taking care of her mother. And she said, I, you know, this is like a last resort. I'm trying to get work, but I don't have a degree. I haven't finished school. Can you please help me? Um, so I don't know who you pictured or what was in your, in your mind, but I always like that just kind of stood out to me as they, you know, sometimes we, we see things one way, but when you hear the full story, you can see things a different way. So those are some of the kind of the biases that you may not necessarily want to acknowledge or even realize are there. That's why they're unconscious. And those are things that you can absolutely train on. Um, there's tons of organizations throughout Oregon that can help and um, contribute to that. I've listed a few of the common um, uh, the common unconscious biases that uh, we're affected by. So in interviewing, you know, uh, something like the affinity, go ducks, you know, it's like, oh, we have something in common. It's very easy to get distracted by that. It's not a negative thing, but it's a relatability thing, right? Like, how am I relating to this stranger in a room and I'm like having to talk to them? So um, kind of similar with the confirmation halo effect. Uh, maybe someone has worked at a company that you admire and you're like, oh, if they've worked there, they're going to be great. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? You still have to do the same due diligence that you would with that person that didn't work at that company. So um, and then working with your HR, TA, TA, and diversity teams, this is a great way to develop structured interviews. Yes, it means this person might get asked the same question by everybody, and I know that that can be for the person being interviewed a little, like, mundane, but it's really meant to streamline a process that can be very uh, varied for each person and uh, make sure that everyone's getting an equal and fair chance across the board. So coming up with a question and then coming up with ways to ask that question differently so that person doesn't necessarily feel like five people are asking, tell me about yourself. And I gave some examples of ways that you can do that. Um, and then we'll go on to the next page. So uh, another way to be inclusive, blinding resumes and applications, removing the names of schools, removing the names of organizations, removing their name or any photos or anything like that. So it's really, again, to focused on the experience that this person brings to the table, creating a rating system. I've seen people use one through five, one through 10, and then you add it up, right? So if you have 10 questions, each worth five points, 50 is the highest. If they score over a 38, you know, this person then moves on to the next round, something like that. Um, that can be challenging. Again, some of the training and upfront kind of coaching with your staff and the, the managers that are gonna be going through the process is very, very helpful. Um, and then making sure that panel's diverse, right? So not just um, this person's manager, but maybe somebody that is going to be their peer, somebody that started in a similar position that's taken a different career path, a different manager from a different division that, depending upon their career growth, they might want to talk to. Um, really, again, up to you, but making sure that you're diversifying the perspective of the people that this person might be engaging with is really another great way to get a, a well-rounded picture of who this person is and how they fit within the organization. Um, and then also employee retention. This is, you know, you've, you've done the work, someone's excited to be there, now they're there, and we've got to make sure the culture aligns with how it was presented. <laughs> this, you know, it's tricky. Um, benefits is probably one of the strongest ways that you can create an inclusive environment. Um, I worked with many individuals that were same sex, same sex couples. And when you're going through adoption processes, even if not a same sex couple, you don't necessarily have the same benefits to parental leave that others do from natural birth. And so a benefit to someone, if they have access to the same sort of leave, um, or medical coverage or things like that, is it's a huge plus um legal guidance and support for those that might be adopting or going through you know personal situations uh caregiver leave so many people i think in covid really kind of show people just need more time sometimes to take care of others and um pet bereavement i know that might sound crazy to some people but i tell you i lost a dog a couple years ago i still cry about it that was so hard in the middle of covid oh i wish i knew i had like my director at the time gave me a day but i could have used more um ergs this is probably one of the most 
uh, popular, well-known ways to uh, do employee retention. Lori, I love that you have so many ERGs. Um, that's incredible. I think that's also having such a large organization having, would you say nine? With seven. Seven, okay. Seven different ERGs is just an acknowledgement to the number of facets of human beings that work within the organization. And that is very representative of a large company. If you have a smaller company that still would like to do an ERG, you can you can do that. And you just you do it as a singular, like the organization and with Scion, there's 70 of us and we have one DEI group and we talk about everything, right? So to really kind of get one off the ground, um, what's your mission? And each, if you have multiple, each each group will have their own mission, right? But as a whole, if you're doing what is our what's our mission as a as an ERG, um, stand up your committees, right? For larger organizations, commit resources to that, and that means like marketing, right? How are we going to communicate to our internal team that this is available to them when someone's onboarded? How will they gain access? Where do they know to go? Um, understand your needs, create centralized communication with HR and your TA teams and your diversity teams, and then mental health support, not just for the ERGs, but especially for the work that's being done and some of the research and the things that go into this needs to get to see, right? It's it's not easy work. So um, second to last slide, and I'll shut up for a minute. Uh, <laughs> so um, creating inclusive environments really comes down to communicating with your organization and the people that, that make it run, right? You know, how are things going? How are you? What's going on outside of work? Um, you know, you don't have to cry, but if someone wants to talk about it, great. Flexibility, uh, not just for working parents and caregivers, um, the neurally diverse which are very rare, rarely talk about. I'm a neurally diverse human. Uh, I am dyslexic. Sometimes I really just need a very quiet place to get my work done. Um, folks with ADD, anything like that. Sometimes there's just spaces are overwhelming and you need some quiet space. So physically diverse, right? Um, do we have ramps? Do we have desks? Do we have things that will help get people to where they need to go and become successful in their role, no matter what their situation is. Um, financially diverse. I don't think that's something that people really think about, but just because someone can't afford to have like, a car full time doesn't mean that they're not worth hiring, right? Um, so a lot of, again, that goes back to benefits, right? Maybe you have a community benefit for somebody. So mentorship and sponsorships, circles programs are great. They're small. Um, intimate circles with somewhere between seven to nine folks that get together and kind of talk about how to be successful in the org or things that they're struggling with, a lot of different things. Training, EAPs, uh, Talkspace specifically actually works with EAPs and that's a, an online mental health uh, tool. There's other better health, pride counseling. There's a ton out there, do your research, um, using inclusive language. I think a lot of times on HR docs, it'll say male, female, other, I don't know how many of us have ever been called an other. Um, doesn't feel great. <laughs> so just those small things make a big difference. Um, and making diversity part of the culture. That's why starting the conversation today with safety and diversity, it's just what we talk about, right? I know I covered a ton of information. It's a quote I really love. When we're talking about diversity, it's not a box to check. It really isn't. This is a, this is a human element and, and it's a factor in everything that we should be doing. Um, and it should be deeply felt and held and valued by all of us. But um, questions? Yay! Got through it. <laughs> Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, let's go with the folks in the chat. Heather. We haven't received questions from anyone in the chat, so let's go to folks in the room. Anything that came up for you that you would like to ask Caitlin about? I was just curious on the LinkedIn posting. Mm -hmm. Do you think they actually have the actual employees write the little thing and then they expect it in this? That's actually a good question. I don't know. Knowing the person that posted it, and I do, I don't think so, but I never want to assume. Yeah, great question, Madam. And the second piece, she was there, whoever wrote it specifically referred to the second candidate. I love her heart centered approach. So it sounds like it was written about them. It sounds like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
You have a very good memory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've read that thing a hundred times. <laughs> yeah. I have a question, and I'm not trying to phrase this, but when sometimes like searching, perhaps we're looking for a diverse candidate. Like we, we realize that there we need more diversity. So we don't want to even to just focus on having diversity within the search, but we're targeting us, you know, we would want to have hire someone who would bring diversity on the team specifically. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to do that type of targeted search and still be like, how do you be inclusive and targeted towards diversity candidates? Does that make sense? It absolutely does. Uh, I think that is a um, conundrum would be the best way I could put that. You know, it's um, it's a double-edged sword because you can go in, in different directions with that. Um, I think the focus, again, should really always be on the skills. Uh, it's knowing where to look for the diversity pool of candidates. candidates. Um, and that comes with, there are tons of resources. Like, oh, I'm happy to share my slides with everybody that's participating so you have access to the links and the sites and all of that. Um, there are specific resources that work directly with um, diverse candidate pools, people of color, uh, things of that nature. So what I would do is not exclude, but include. So that it's, you know, again, still this, within the scope. I need this person to have this experience, but I'm looking at these people instead of these people, if that helps. Yeah. <laughs> If I could kind of go off of that question, so we'll be hiring more people soon. And so for our first hire, I know just people I know. And so yep. there's only three of us today, but we'll be hiring like five more in the coming months. So within that is how do we cast that broadest that possible? Is there, is there like, you know, do we do more than just like, of course, like there's LinkedIn posts mm -hmm. and, then, and then different job boards. But is there like, do you have suggestions for like, do you target like specific like professional networks or things like that? Any suggestions there? Yeah, yeah. I, if so, I've worked with so many small startups that start with who do we know? Because that's easy, right? It's a known entity, it's a known resource, you, they're trusted. Um, and I've seen them get in trouble because you've now created a culture where everyone knows everyone. Yeah. And so now when you have that outsider coming in, even if they're very well aligned with your mission. They know exactly what they're doing. They're they're very uh, equipped to come in and, and succeed. The culture might be, I feel very much like an outsider. So kind of checking yourself and, and making sure that you're not only mission aligned, but you're open to, to what that person is. As far as going out there and attracting the talent, um, Again, kind of same answers that I, I just gave. It's really about being as um, inclusive versus exclusive. There are tons of recruiting tools available to you. I would say startups really do benefit. And this is not tooting my own because I work in an agency form, but working with people that are ingrained in the area and industry that you're, you're looking at. Our job as recruiters in an agency is to really have a wide network of individuals um, and be able to kind of see beyond where you are as a company and partner with you in a way that we act as an extension. But that can also help you get a different perspective of just your really good friends mm -hmm. and, and the network that you're in. Hopefully that kind of sort of answers yep. your question. And I'm happy to give you more like insights on ways to approach those tools to help give you um, market access. I just don't want to take up too much time. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah, I'll yeah. Leave you later. Thank perfect. You. Yeah, absolutely. One question. So my company uh, has a lot of business that we do out of the U.S., but is primarily based out of the U.K. Mm -hmm. And I've been told on this new role with the diversity committee that DEI, DNI are essentially different beasts between the country. So the way that the entirety of the company tends to go about certain aspects of DEI don't necessarily align in what we would want to see in the States. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question is, do you have any talking points, recommendations uh, when bringing these um executive leadership as to stressing the importance and really showing the benefits that DEI has throughout an entirety of a company, regardless of where home base may be. Yeah. Um, also not easy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I really think successful DEI programs always start at the top. 
Mm -hmm. right? Um, you can have the best employees and be most diverse, but if if leadership is kind of blind to how to lead that team, it can be really challenging. Um, I mean, you can try to swim upstream and have them see how you see it, mm -hmm. or you can try to see it as they see it and create some sort of amalgamation of the two, really, and, and know that here are your strong points, here's where you're struggling, here's where you want to be, and know that it, it's always a roadmap. You know, again, there's no silver bullet and it's not going to be adjusted today. Um, but working with them and, you know, sometimes the proof is in the pudding, I hate to put it that way, but sometimes you got to kind of show them and statistics and data and numbers most often speak to leaders. And so maybe having some of that to present and kind of showing them the why behind the ask um, can oftentimes really help them see the vision. Yeah. Hopefully that kind of helps answer your question. Definitely, yeah. definitely. A uh, quick follow-up. Do you have any organizations, resources that you advise companies to reach out to to essentially audit any DEI initiatives that they may have? I do, but we'll talk about that offline. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? You don't have to go to overseas to have that problem. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Very, very true. East Coast, West Coast huge huge difference so i mean i think you know a lot of people try to go overboard trying to protect the culture the problem is that sometimes the culture you were trying to protect is exclusive in its own right mm -hmm. so i've seen that i mean that used to happen in silicon valley all the time mm -hmm. it's like everybody that joined uh alphabet or google was in this particular team they all had to be windsurfers if you weren't a wind server, you never got in that server. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's a lot of challenges. I think for startups, we don't have the, I don't want to say, we don't get to focus on DEI because we have to get people that can do the job. And you have to get past a certain point where you can start focusing on a little bit of things, mm -hmm. depending on the type of business. I mean, I'm in biotech, so it's pretty much, if they can't do the job, they're not. Yeah. And if they can do the job, the chance of finding someone else that can do it, you just have to take the first person that comes and then worry about how you make that first fit after you've got the organization together. But it's it's a totally different beast when you're doing, you know, because a startup in biotech, the average lifetime is two and a half years, mm -hmm. I think is the half life. So it's, and now it's probably even less because it's so financially tough out there yeah yeah building on your uh culture it's interesting when people say we're really culturally driven it's a great thing but oftentimes it can mean that you're actually segregating people out right we're this like vivacious gregarious out there we love we're you know like these talking and we're best friends and like somebody that might be a great fit for your team might not be that person and that is I've, I've seen it firsthand where you're like, well, they're just not a fit for the team. It's like, but, but maybe they are. Maybe you need that kind of quiet or reserved person to come in and when they speak, it's like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, culture is, it's hard. And, it, it is hard. Yeah. And it's invariably going to change as you grow. Yes. I mean, there are certain numbers of employees you reach and you will have a shift. It's unavoidable. Yeah. I used to have the numbers in the back of the head because I'd seen it so many times. You get to 25 and then you get to 45 and, and, and so on. So I think it gets to be really tough to base it on something like that as opposed to some broader issues or just making sure everyone can work together. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Right. If anyone on Zoom wants to chime in with a question, please feel free. Just wait a sec, nothing in the chat? No, everybody on Zoom is quiet today. <laughs> They're wishing they were here having lunch. Yes. Perfect. I, I do have a quick question, um, just kind of around um, metrics and measuring outcomes. 
um, what is the best way to kind of collect this voluntary demographic information in a way that doesn't make people feel alienated or feel like they have to disclose, particularly around narrow non-typicalness or, or gender preferences and things like that? What, it, what is a good way to, to make sure that you're doing well by tracking that progress, but not, but doing it, especially in a small team where it really can't be anonymous? Sure. I mean, yeah, that, that's another, this is what makes the work so hard, right? Um, I don't know if you, Lori, have any thoughts on that? It's, ch- it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's we're in a little bit different boat because of our our federal contractor obligations. So, I mean, we and we we're only we're not we have talked about gathering information on other things that federal you know OFCCP is not requiring us to, and it it's tough because and and there's just differing opinions even amongst folks that are in various groups, whether it's LGBT or whatever that that you know other groups that. I don't want that in my HR record anywhere, mm-hmm. right? I'm out, I'm proud, and I don't, you know, so it, it's it's a tricky thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if there's an, there's an answer, and I think, unfortunately, the answer is you just don't track, is I think the default, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I mean, I've seen it done with <clears throat> surveys, annual surveys, quarterly surveys. Um, I think sometimes understanding the why behind the ask is really beneficial, right? You know, like, are you just collecting data on me so you can check a box or does this actually mean something to you? What are you doing with this information? What does it mean? Um, And if people are on board with the meaning behind it, you might have more success in tracking it. But, you know, if I'm just filling something out for the sake of filling something out, then I'm probably not going to be very honest, you know, or open, I shouldn't say honest, but open with you on, on maybe some of those more kind of personal questions. Well, it can be a, it can be an issue of safety too. I mean, mm-hmm. Of course, when you're queer or neurodivergent, um, you sometimes get treated differently. Absolutely. And there are these unconscious biases that people have and they can be expressed in the most minute ways uh, and it's really easy for people to become sort of sidelined and um, microaggressed in the workplace and othered mm-hmm. and when that happens like you don't get the same contributions you get some mental health issues that come with that and it's yeah so a, a lot of I, I'm a queer person myself and so I don't I don't have any problem disclosing it but I live in the relative safety of Portland Oregon mm-hmm. um, and I'm a white person so there's an extra layer of safety there uh, but I have a lot of friends in the Midwest and the East Coast who are not out publicly beyond their small circle because it's so dangerous to be so keeping that in mind that it's not always just about like bravery mm-hmm. coming out sometimes it's it's literally safety mm-hmm. yeah absolutely yeah. And also, just to kind of follow up, like, yeah, I mean, particularly for us operating in the four states we do, um, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Utah, we come up with, yeah, we're, we're pretty, you know, split company in that way. And so it, um, we have to be very conscious in that. And that is what we have chosen not to, because it's just, to require, yeah, yeah to, to require anything other than what, what the federal government requires us to collect. Yeah. So I guess following up on the question, how <clears throat> measure success? along with the same point where people go on and track you know on the record have you seen any success with kind of asking for this information anonymously like where you get a fill out of service but survey but it's not linked back to you directly you're just crowdsourcing and so do you think that would be successful i would think it would depend on the culture um and and again to the to the point that caitlin made earlier about being clear about what you're doing with that information um, I think that that could be successful if you've got an organization that is pretty safe, um, you know, and and safe is relative because it's it's individual. Yeah. Um, then I think it's worth a try as long as you're clear about what you're doing with the information. Um, yeah, I'm not. I haven't say I am can't say I've seen it done. But I could see that. I mean, we I was on the board of a nonprofit and we were actually talking about doing that exact same thing. And then yeah, I don't I don't know. I 
peeled off the board eventually, but I, I don't know where they ended up landing with that, but we were talking about doing that just anonymously. I've been a part of an org that did it um, through a third party. So the third party was managing the information. Um, there was a ton of preemptive communication around it and the messaging was really what you're comfortable with. You don't have to participate. Why we're doing it. Um, and that seemed to garner decent results, but that was also a very large organization. You know, if you're talking three, three people, <laughs> it might be kind of hard to be anonymous because I know one of them, right? You know, like that that gets a little tricky, but I think if it's, you know, for a company like Scion, who I'm with now is, you know, it is in it is part of we talk about it all the time um, and we really want to kind of put our, our money where our mouth is when it comes to like, we don't just talk about diversity, we are a culture of diversity and we talk about our own diverse numbers and that's kind of the, the, the way that we approach our own business and how we feel comfortable in approaching others about these sorts of conversations. And so I think knowing that people feel more safe to, to disclose whatever they're comfortable disclosing in a much smaller environment, but you think, yeah, Lori's right. It's really just kind of, it's so situational. Um, I think consulting organizations that really do focus and specialize on this, even if it's just a conversation to help you figure out, okay, what foot goes first and in what direction? And then you kind of build on it from there um, because you're going to get it wrong. I mean, that's, it's inevitable. You For someone out there, you, you will get it wrong. It's, it's just kind of part of the process. But being communicative with the group and really understanding how only makes you better and you can you keep pushing and you just have to acknowledge and move on right like that's just kind of part of it so it looks like we do have questions in the chat heather we, we have one question how do you uplift marginalized slash underrepresented communities or employees without tokenizing them especially if you are an org that doesn't have a whole lot of marginalized folks yet mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that that's a that's a tough yeah. question. Um, I I would say be careful on how you celebrate someone. Um, if you're acknowledging them for being different, that can make them feel that much more different. Um, you know, if it's the work that they're doing, or uh, you know, they volunteered for a project and they're you know knocking it out of the park, or you know, making it about all of them, not just the part of them, because I think acknowledging some of those um, traits or characteristics can feel very alienating. Um, ho hopefully that kind of answers that. I don't know if you don't want to accidentally out somebody. Right. Yeah. 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 I think you have to tread very lightly. And I, I think when it comes to recognition, regardless of what we're recognizing about an individual, I think it's, it's important um, to also know how that person wants to be recognized and mm -hmm. you know because i mean there's some i mean it's just let's just you know even around birthdays you know there is that like do not throw me a birthday party like, the folks that are like <laughs> do not do that that is going to make me feel really uncomfortable and others are you know i have a coworker from my last job that it was like her birthday month right and <laughs> everybody knew in the company that it was her birthday so um i think there's all the, that individualization about how you know if this is going to be something we're celebrating, then you've got to you've got to align with that person's wishes as well. Mm -hmm. All right, we're good. Well, thank you. Yeah, this is really really helpful, really beneficial. A lot of great information. Appreciate Laura, you being here too, and your perspective as well. That was really helpful. Yeah, um, in the Q and A, especially to be talking, you know different um, experiences there. So um, this program is being recorded. I will send the recording with everybody, including folks in the room, as well as the podcast. So thank you so much. Um, we certainly appreciate it. And um, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.